Please welcome British architect and innovator, otherwise known as the pioneer of biomimicry, Michael Pollan. So, I'm going to talk about biomimicry, and I'm going to try and persuade you that this is one of the best sources of solutions to help us address the, the challenges of the next few uh, decades. And put simply, bio biomimicry is design inspired by nature. So it's looking at that amazing catalog of solutions that have benefited from a 3.8 billion year research and development period, and, and learning from that to develop solutions that are better suited to human needs. And just to make sure you all kind of understand what I'm talking about, I'll give you an example of biomimicry. And some biomimicry stories do have quite engaging starting points. So this one involves a marine biologist whose genuine name was Dr. Frank Fish. And um, he was looking at the, the uh, flippers of a humpback whale one day. Notice he had these lumps on the front of them. And um, he was puzzled by this. And it turned out that these tubercles, as they're called, uh, improve the hydrodynamics at slow speeds. So humpback whales, they swim in quite slow, tight circles. And uh, these help with maneuverability. And his idea from that was, um, why not uh, create a wind turbine blade with the same idea that could maintain operation at slow wind speeds? And it's claimed that these uh, blades can improve the output of a wind turbine by as much as 5% over the course of a year. And what I'm going to do now is just show a, a brief selection of projects, mainly uh, water-focused, that have used these ideas so that you get a better sense of just how uh, good a, a source of solutions biomimicry is. This one is a, a, concept, a concept for an ultra-low energy data center. The site is a mountain in Norway that has already been carved out for marble mining. So it's already got 90 kilometers of very cold tunnels. And the design challenge for us was, how do we get that free source of cooling, the cold air, and draw it through the data blocks in the most efficient way possible? And the reason it's here in the first place is because data centers use a huge amount of energy just to keep them cool. So we looked at branching systems in biology uh, for clues about how to conduct gases and liquids around efficiently. Now this leaf shows a, a perfect demonstration of biological principles. There's a, a very specific ratio between the diameters of those branching systems. There's a very particular angle at which that branching occurs, and there's a, a very particular finessing to those junctions. There's nothing accidental about that at all. That is an, an evolved minimum energy solution to the challenge um, of uh, getting the fluids around the leaf. So we applied very similar principles to the data center. We clustered the blocks around into circles to reduce pipe length. And then we designed that branching system based on biological principles. And this is how the showcase server will look at the center of the mountain. And it does have a bit of a James Bond quality to it, this project, because first of all, you have to come, come in through a sort of laser scanner for security. You go down this long tunnel, you get into a boat to cross an underground lake, and you end up at the showcase server. And, um, and then there's going to be a shaft cut up through the mountain to take the warm air away up to a disused quarry where the client wants to have a, a mini version of the Eden project, and he can sit there stroking his white cat. So we... Um, we developed those ideas a bit further uh, when we were asked to get involved in a, a tender for a, a massive new water treatment facility in Qatar. And we looked around at examples of water treatment facilities that had already been built, such as, as this one. And when I looked at that, I thought, well, it doesn't look all that efficient. You know, it's, it's, it's quite rectilinear. Um, there's quite a lot of space between the elements. And um, one of my engineer colleagues said to me, isn't that very arrogant of you as an architect to think you could improve on something that engineers have been working on for decades? I said, well, hold on, hold on. It's not really about being arrogant. It's about being curious. This tender was going to be determined partly based on 10 years running costs. So that, for an energy-intensive piece of infrastructure like that, that's, that's huge. So my uh, grumpy engineer colleague conceded that, yes, all right, if we could make a few percent saving in energy consumption, that would be worth doing. So I got a, a boffin in my office to develop a little design tool based on those biological uh, branching systems. And what we have here is a hypothetical layout. The white circles are bits of equipment. And then there's a, a pipe layout that connects them. And what the algorithm does is it works out the optimum relative positioning of those elements 
and the optimum branching angle. And if you look at the figure down at the bottom there, you can see that the total length of the pipework came down to just below 64% of the starting point. And it ends up looking quite biological, but not because we're trying to look biological, it's because it's based on biological principles. And then we took this a step further, this term working with a, a, an experienced mechanical engineer. By coincidence, it's Nick Jeffries, who's going to be speaking at 2 o'clock. And now we used all the right elements of a water treatment facility in the right uh, sequence. And this time, we combined the figure for total length and average angle into a figure for total equivalent length. And that's a pretty good measure of the overall friction in the system. And you can see that that came down to, to well below 40%. And so I think that, that shows just how much we could learn from biology in, in optimizing the kind of systems that we're designing into industries, into our infrastructure, and even into cities. So now on to the Sahara Forest Project. This is something that I jointly initiated uh, just over 10 years ago. We were trying to address multiple challenges simultaneously here. So rather than just looking at, say, climate change or water shortages or desertification as separate issues, we were trying to think of clever integrated solutions based on biomimicry that could address this. And we were quite startled to learn that a lot of the world's deserts were actually vegetated a fairly short time ago. So just um, 2,000 years ago, when Julius Caesar's armies arrived, what the Greeks them was this wooded landscape of cedar trees and cypress trees. And they cut all those down uh, to create an intensive farm and essentially trashed that landscape. They even changed the climate. We know from the writings of Pliny that that actually had quite a plentiful rainfall regime previously. And one of the many organisms that we studied was the Namibian fog-basking beetle. So this is a beetle that can harvest its own water out of the air in a desert. And that uh, turned into an idea for a greenhouse, a seawater-cooled greenhouse. So it evaporates seawater to cool and humidify the air. And then we looked at other technologies that could work symbiotically with that greenhouse. And this is the one we settled on as the best candidate, concentrated solar power. And that and the greenhouse had some very interesting synergies. Both work very well in hot, sunny deserts. The, the concentrated solar power can be as much as 10% more productive with seawater cooling. And then, in many ways, the most interesting synergy was that the shade created by those mirrors would make it possible to grow things um, that would not normally grow simply because of the intensity of the sun. This was the first visualization we created showing these long runs of seawater-cooled greenhouses with concentrated solar power plants along the way. We managed to get some very nice publicity for that. Um, and then uh, we, we got some funding to do studies in, in Qatar and Jordan. And this was the, the scheme that we built in Qatar. Uh, so here we were looking at two forms of solar energy. That's the seawater-cooled greenhouse in the middle. We also had algae, salt processing, uh, revegetation uh, experiments. This was it on site, and this was it on opening day. So it was opened by the Emir of Qatar during the 2012 climate change talks. And we produced cucumbers throughout the summer months with half the amount of fresh water of conventional approaches. And alongside refining all the technical systems, we had a hunch that this was going to be delivering some kind of regenerative benefit to the biodiversity. And um, oh, sorry, just before I come on to that, this, this summarizes the, um, the system. So what we're trying to do is mimic ecosystems. Uh, so in an ecosystem, you have a lot of interdependent organisms, and there's no such thing as waste. All the underutilized resources from one part of the ecosystem become nutrient for something else. And in simple terms, we're using what we have a lot of, sunlight, seawater, and carbon dioxide, to produce more of what we need, biomass, oxygen, electricity, crops, and materials. And I don't have time to go through all those interconnections, but essentially what we were trying to do was to look at every single underutilized resource and see how we could turn that into added value. So that it moves towards being a highly productive system that runs entirely on solar energy and produces all sorts of useful outputs. And those kind of systems might look complicated, and they are, uh, but we've developed a design tool that makes it easier to do this. So this allows you to enter the different 
uh, technologies with their resource inputs and outputs and to connect them up, a bit like a sort of plumbing diagram. And then you can press play and it shows you how it works. If there's anything showing up as underutilized, that's a sign that you could add something to the system to create more value. You can also test for resilience by choosing one of those links and cutting it. And if the whole system goes into breakdown, then that's an indication you need to add further elements to improve the, the um, uh, redundancy or duplication to make it a more resilient system. And now on to that um, issue of the biodiversity, which I was talking about. So at the start, it was just a bare patch of desert. And we, we wanted to see what kind of beneficial effects we were going to be having. So we just made a note of any mammals, birds, and insects that appeared on site. And this uh, diagram shows what we achieved. So the first things to appear were flies, nothing particularly interesting there. Then literally the same day that the plants were brought to site, we had the first birds appearing. And soon after that, we had uh, grasshoppers and crickets. And then a month later, we had the first uh, butterflies. And bear in mind, this was about five kilometers from the nearest patch of planting. So it's quite miraculous where these things come from. Um, and then we had more birds, so wagtails and more insects. And then we had the first problematic species. So these were rats, and their numbers were starting to uh, multiply rather alarmingly. Um, but still, we're getting more birds and more insects, which was nice. Then we had mice to deal with as well, um, which is a bit of a pain. But still, more birds, more insects, which is lovely. And then um, we had dragonflies. Three days after the algae ponds were filled, we had the first dragonflies appearing. And again, I don't know where they came from. It's quite miraculous how nature can recover if you can just make the right conditions for it. And then um, we had an appearance from a feral cat, which is quite nice because the number of rats started going down. Uh, more birds, more insects. Uh, we had a visit from quite a rare bird, a hoopoe, and then rufous-tailed shrikes, more types of wagtails, and eventually we had the uh, first indigenous mammal, and that was a jaboa. It's like a little hopping kangaroo, leaves very distinctive tracks. So that was all achieved on a site 100 meters by 100 meters in just eight months. And I'm absolutely convinced that if we were to do that on a larger scale over a longer time span, that regenerative effect would be even more pronounced. So the final project I'm going to talk about is this one. Uh, it's a, a project that was going to be in the, in the Middle East. And we were asked if we could do something clever with water. And we looked at lots of um, animals and plants that did clever things um, in desert environments. So this one is the thorny devil. This can drink with its feet. If it's standing on damp ground, the water tracks up capillary grooves on its skin all the way up to its lips, and then it licks its lips and looks rather pleased with itself. But that wasn't the star that we settled on. The star we settled on was actually uh, camel's nostrils, and I'll explain that in a minute. There are two other elements to this, Persian ice making and solar cooling. So let me explain. Camels, very underappreciated. They're sometimes described as a, a horse designed by committee. It's so disrespectful. <laughs> you know, if you look at a section through a camel's nose, it has these very intricate passageways called nasal turbinates. And those are richly vascular, they're sort of bony structures. And as the camel breathes in the dry desert air, those turbinate surfaces evaporate moisture into the air so it's cooled and humidified and is less of a shock to the system. And then when the camel breathes out, that air is now warm and humid and it passes those same surfaces which are cool because of evaporation and a lot of that moisture condenses and is recaptured by the camel. The small amount of moisture that it loses in the air that it breathes out, it gets evaporative cooling benefits from that. So it can keep its brain and eyeballs as much as 8 degrees C cooler than the rest of its body. So then the next one, Persian ice making. The easiest way to explain this is to just look at some comparative temperatures. Let's say the temperature of the desert at night is about 30 degrees C, which is quite cozy. The temperature of outer space is minus 273 degrees C, which is a bit nippy. And on a clear night, you can get a black surface to radiate heat out to outer space. And the ancient Persians worked this out. They would put down a bed of straw for insulation. They would put a shallow ceramic tray on that with a black glaze and a thin layer of water lasting at night. And that radiative effect was enough to turn that water into ice. And they would scoop it up before sunrise and use it to make drinks and impress their friends. The third element, solar cooling, this uses evacuated tube solar collectors. 
which produce very high temperature hot water and close to boiling point. And you can use this as an energy input for what's called an absorption chiller, which uses pressure cycles a bit like a fridge. But instead of using electricity as the energy input, you can use heat and you get cooling out. And what's elegant about that is that on the hottest, sunniest days, you get the maximum cooling. Right, so how did we put these ideas together for a building? Well, the kind of core principle is a, a clever roof. So this is a, a high emissivity surface. During the day, we have louvers which keep the sun off that. And then at night, we open those up to open up that radiation pathway to the night sky. And that will make the underside slightly cooler. So it's more likely that uh, condensation can occur. And then what we wanted to do was to maximize the surface area, a bit like the camel's nostrils. So we created these fins to maximize the surface area and applied to those an existing product, uh, which is a, a fog net. So this has been refined and developed. And then if we want even more um, output from this, we can run solar cooling down those fins. And in the evening, when the humidity rises to above 90%, as it often does in this part of the world, we'd get a lot of moisture condensing, which would run down to channels, and then we can use that for the building. Then with the building form, we didn't want the wind that was close to the ground, because that would be picking up heat from the ground. We wanted the wind slightly further off the ground. And that suggested some kind of wind scoop that would channel the, the air down. During the design process, we were told this might have to form the entrance to another uh, building. So we, then we started thinking of some really quite large, heroic arch. And putting the two together, the scoop and the arch, it led to this Pringle shape. And the idea is to uh, sit this above a, a landscaped auditorium for outdoor uh, performances. And then the whole of that roof surface would be the camel's nostril collection surfaces. So that would run down to a channel around a central oculus. And when the performance is about to start, we could have a theatrical shower of rain around the, the edge of the stage that would tell people to uh, uh, stop talking and, and uh, get ready for the performance. And then uh, this is a sketch showing it a, a little bit later on. Uh, so you can see the um, auditorium inside an oasis garden, all supplied with this uh, camel's nostril water collection system. And then this was the scheme a little bit further on. Um, uh, sadly, this, uh, this project get, got cancelled uh, just after Donald Trump was elected. And that was because the person that was going to be paying for it was dependent, for, uh, the US, dependent on the US for about a third of their business. And they decided that um, they didn't really need to spend all this if their business were going to be impacted by the sort of chill wind blowing out of Donald Trump's administration towards the Islamic world. So, you know, another good reason to uh, dislike Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I'll try and stay clear of politics. Uh, so to conclude now, uh, you can probably tell that I'm, I'm a kind of evangelist for biomimicry. And I do believe it's of, of critical importance to the, to the present moment. Because we, we're going to need to completely rethink what it means to be human on planet Earth. If, if we're to really address the, the multiple challenges uh, that we're facing of climate breakdown and biodiversity loss and, and many others, we're going to fundamentally need to rethink what our role is on planet Earth. And that includes rethinking our attitude to nature. So historically, we, we tended to live by an idea of conquering nature, as Francis Bacon uh, described. Since then, we've moved more towards kind of protecting small bits of nature, uh, but now I think we need to move to, to an idea of uh, looking at nature as a source of, of wonder and a source of amazing solutions. And this, for me, is just one of the best examples of that. This is a, a glass sponge, and uh, it lives in quite uh, deep water conditions, and it makes these absolutely beautiful structures, incredibly efficient. Structural engineers have studied these to try and understand just how efficient they are. And all of that is made at ambient temperature and pressure out of locally available materials, silica and calcium carbonate. And uh, this organism has cultivated a symbiotic relationship with bioluminescent bacteria in the seabed. And each of the fibers going down into the seabed is a, an optical fiber with higher optical quality than human-made fibers. And at the end of each, it's the, the image on the, the right there, bottom right, at the end of each of those is a cluster of lenses 
that focus light from the bioluminescent bacteria, conduct it up the, the, the um, fibers, and put on a kind of lighting display on the structure to draw food to the organism. And that, I think, is a great example of just how much we have got still to learn from biology. 3.8 billion years of research and development, 3.8 billion years of brilliant ideas illuminated by previously unparalleled scientific knowledge, facilitated by previously unimaginable digital design tools. We have never had such an opportunity to rethink and design a positive future. Thank you.